Good afternoon. Um, I am exceptionally happy to be here this afternoon for a number of reasons. First of all, because we are here. <laughs> this, this is the first uh, in-person program that we have had since last fall. Uh, and I am, yeah, yes, clap. Yes. Uh, and I am hoping that this is going to be the first of many now that we can continue with the in-person programs. Um, fortunately, we still are wearing masks and we still do not have uh, refreshments, but um, hopefully that will change in the not too far distant future. Uh, the other reasons that I am happy uh, is the weather is what it is today and not what it was yesterday. Um, and I'm, one of the most happy reasons I am happy is uh, the person who's sitting over there on the bench. Uh, we have hired our new uh, administrator after a three-month period when we didn't have an administrator, and that is Joanne Gillis. And we are extremely happy, extremely happy to have her on board. Uh, if you haven't met her, uh, try to take some time before you leave to introduce yourself to her. Uh, she, is, she is a whiz and already making uh, an impression on the organization. Um, the other thing that I want to mention before uh, we um, have our speaker begin is that this year is the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Historical Society. And, <laughs> excuse me, and we are hoping uh, to make it a, a good and happy year too. Uh, starting in May, we are going to have a number of events to celebrate um, the anniversary of the Historical Society. The first one will be um, a opening of an, of an exhibit. Um, last year, we did one in recognition of the 60th anniversary of the KAC, and we will have one for the 60th anniversary of the Historical Society. Uh, we will also, um, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we were also hoping to have um, some kind of um, event on the green in the summertime, maybe an ice cream social, uh, to give back to the community with other kinds of activities. Um, our annual meeting, we hope will be in person here in the, uh, in the building, um, not quite as elaborate as they have been in the past, but in the fall, we are planning on having an annual meeting dinner postponed, uh, but a celebratory dinner, uh, maybe at the Scandinavia Club, which is traditionally where the annual meeting dinners were held in the past. Um, one other thing um, that I want to ask you <laughs> if maybe anybody has or knows where I can get it. Uh, I'm looking for photographs of some of the past presidents and first directors of the Historical Society for the exhibit. And that would be photographs of Helen Rudd, Seward Dawes, John Elliott, or Patricia Colmer. If anybody has those photographs or knows where I can get a photograph of those individuals if you could uh, give us a call or send us an email. Okay, now why we're all here and why I'm excited about this program this afternoon. Um, we have a speaker who is going to tell us um, something about the life of Ellen View Root that probably most of us did not know. We knew the high spots but uh, about getting the Peace Prize and being the Secretary of War and being the Secretary of State, but not some of the uh, other aspects of his life. So we are lucky to have this afternoon, David Herman with us. He is a retired uh, Foreign Service Officer with 25 years career in the area of environmental and water diplomacy from 20, 2017 to 2018. He worked as a senior advisor to the U.S. section of the internet. <laughs> this is a mouthful, David. <laughs> to, the, to the U.S. section of the International Joint Commission, which manages our shared water resources with Canada. This is where he first learned about Elihu Root's role in U.S.-Canada water relations. He was also the environmental chief in the Office of Canadian Affairs from 2019 to 2011, 2009 to 2011, where he worked on the new regulation plan for Lake Ontario and helped negotiate a revision of the Great Lakes water quality management. David moved to Clinton two and a half years ago with his family and is glad to be living in such a scenic area surrounded by history, 
which just by the way is also the home of Elihu Root. Please join me in welcoming David Herman. Thank you very much, Rose, for that kind introduction. I appreciate that. And thank you, thank you all for coming out to uh, hear my presentation today. And uh, I hope I'm able to do Elihu Root justice and uh, um, that you'll find it as interesting as I uh, have found his life and his work on uh, some of these issues fascinating. Um, and by the way, it was, it was when we moved to Clinton, it was quite, you know, that was, a, that was a great, can you hear me now? How about now? Maybe I'll I can do that. Should I just use a handheld? Yeah, I, I mean, that's better, but um, yeah, let me just turn this off and use a handheld. That's fine. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Are you okay flipping the slides for that? Yeah, I think so. I, how's that? Is that better? Yeah. So when we moved to Clinton, um, yeah, that was that was a, a nice coincidence to find out that this was actually the home of Elliot Root. I, I knew who he was and I'd heard about him and read about him, but I didn't know this is where he was from. So. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was inspired to, uh, you know, ask to be able to do this presentation at the Historical Society. So um, I also want to preview that the, the theme for my talk today is basically about how a treaty that was negotiated by a Clinton native has uh, resulted and led to the great alliance, the great friendship that the United States has with Canada and how important that has been um, to our, you know, our relations with our neighbor to the north, but also has allowed us to prosper and um, basically become the world leader that we are today. And I think in light of everything that's going on in Ukraine these days, I think it's more important than ever to talk about things like, you know, how treaties like the boundary treaties, boundary water treaty works, um, why they work. And it's, it's also good to remember that, um, you know, we should not always take our, our relations with a country like Canada for granted. We have a great friendship and alliance with them, but um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work to keep that alliance going, right, and keep that friendship going. It's like, you know, it's not it's not a given that we would necessarily um, be friend, you know, have such good relations with them. And one of the reasons that we do, I would submit, is because of uh, things like the Boundary Waters Treaty. So before we really get started, um, Hmm. Why is that not moving forward? Let me just stop screen sharing a minute. Apologies. The slideshow. Maybe just been stuck. Yeah, there we go. Okay, apologies for that. So, a couple of acknowledgments. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're the land that we're on was originally uh, inhabited by the Oneida people, the Onyata Og people. Um, and my understanding is that they were actually compensated for this land, but it's still, you know, it's still worthwhile for us to honor their memory by uh, by one by taking care of the land and also by remembering who was here first. Um, I also want to acknowledge this gentleman, Gordon Walker, who was the Canadian chair of the International Joint Commission when I worked there. Um, and much of my talk today is based on conversations I had with him and things I picked up from listening to him talk and, and also a, a, a article he wrote for a law journal back in 2015 that was entitled the, the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909, a peace treaty. So I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Walker for some of the inspiration for my presentations today. So I think most people who live in Clinton know about Elihu Root. We're familiar with Root Glen, of course. Uh, people have driven by the, it's, you know, the Elihu Root house up at Hamilton College. Um, I'm guessing there have other been, been other presentations here at the Historical Society about Elihu Root where people have covered his life in more detail and probably better than, than I could. But uh, I do want to share some interesting things that I found out about him during this research, um, things that made me admire him 
uh, even more. You know, he was arguably Clinton's most famous son. He grew up here. He attended Hamilton College, um, where his father taught mathematics, uh, graduated first in his class at the age of 19, and went on to have an extraordinary record of uh, accomplishment throughout his life. Um, and I would, I would offer is not as uh, widely known or is, is appreciated or recognized as he should be for uh, many of his achievements. Um, some achievements that have helped shape shaped our country today. Um, you know, he was also very much a man of his times. Uh, and, uh, you know, despite all his significant achievements had some values that might not uh, fit into our, our perspective on things today. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So I think most people know he was a very prominent corporate lawyer. Um, he was a counsel to many leading bankers, financiers, industrialists, um, you know, the railroads, uh, you know, all the leading people of the, the day and um, back in the late 1800s. Uh, and then uh, in 1899, he was appointed to Secretary of War by President McKinley and, and uh, continued in that role into the uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt administration. And this is despite, by the way, having no military background himself. Oops, actually, I'm not ready yet for that. Then he went on to become Secretary of State uh, under President Roosevelt from 1905 to 1909. Uh, then he was a senator from New York. And this was at a time when there was no uh, popular election of US senators. They were basically elected by the, the state legislature. So that too, uh, it was a state legislature that sent uh, Elihu Root to the, to the US Senate. And he was also, uh, he was a statesman, um, trusted confidant of many of American presidents and uh, political leaders of his day. And after he, you know, after he was out of office himself, and he was also what was considered the first U.S. Uh, foreign policy grandmaster. So, and uh, this, I'm going to read to you from a, a quote that I, I found on him from a, there was a professor, Alfred McCoy of uh, Yale and University of Wisconsin, who had argued that Root was the first foreign policy grandmaster in American history, and that it was Root more than any other figure who was responsible for transforming America into a world power. And according to Professor McCoy, he, Root devoted his time as Secretary of State and as a Senator to ensuring that the United States would have a consistent presence in world affairs. And he helped establish the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain that became so important. Uh, he also helped to ensure that powerful business interests in the intellectual elite in America supported an interventionist foreign policy. So, you know, before this time, America, we had the Monroe Doctrine, where we, we were mostly focused basically on ourselves and then also just our own backyard, so to speak. Um, and it was really Root that sort of uh, brought us into the position, into the role of a, a, a rising uh, global power. So many notable achievements over his lifetime. Uh, he had defended uh, William um, Boss Tweed of, that's you know, famous from Tammany Hall. He did a lot when he was Secretary of War to reform the War Department. You know, now we call it Department of Defense. Back then it was the War Department. He, uh, he um, enlarged and reformed West Point, uh, created the Army War College. He did a lot um, to improve the training uh, and promotion system in the US military. And again, this is despite having no military background himself. Um, similarly, when he became the uh, Secretary of State, I think Joanne is also a foreign former Foreign Service officer will appreciate this. He modernized the US Foreign Service. So uh, before Root, a lot of our diplomats overseas and especially our consular officers, um, they basically would be sent to some other foreign you know, capital or port city and they would just stay there for years and their income, their compensation would derive from charging fees for their services to whoever, whatever the, you know, the foreigners that came to visit them for a US visa or a, you know, some sort of import permit. Um, and they would charge them fees. So Root did away with that. Um, and I'm gonna read to you something. And this is from the, uh, the website of the Office of Historian of the US Department of State. Um, Root also worked to reorganize the Department of State in unprecedented ways. He sought to professionalize the foreign service and the consular service so that it was no longer a fee-based, based on, you know, the, no longer fee-based compensation. He created the first foreign service exam. 
He instituted new methods of record keeping in the department, devised a system of rotating members of the diplomatic service to give them greater experience, and organized the department by geographic regions. And then the, the Office of the Historian of the State Department goes on to say, these reforms would ultimately prove to be more enduring than Root's contributions to foreign policy. Um, I would argue that's not true because I think he had a lot of, you know, very significant achievements of foreign policy, but this is, a, this is the opinion of the Office of the Historian of the Department of State. Uh, while he was Secretary of State, he also negotiated many treaties and expanded global influence. Um, he uh, maintained an open door policy in Asia so that we were not shut out of trade with China and other countries in Asia by the Euro European powers. He toured South America um, to help improve relations there. He held a, a peace uh, conference with Central American countries. He uh, negotiated a gentleman's agreement with Japan to limit immigration from that country. Um, and he negotiated over 40 uh, arbitration agreements of which the Boundary Waters Treaty is, uh, I would argue, the, the most important one. Um, and then of course, as, as people know, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1913. So a lot of achievements, but also uh, not, without his, not without his critics. And uh, um, we mentioned before he defended Boss Tweed. So, you know, he was very, uh, very well known with the you know, leading industrialists and such of the day, but he was also, you know, people would argue he was also very cozy with a lot of the so-called robber barons of the day. Uh, very strong opponent of women's suffrage. Uh, so he was a vocal critic of feminism and he actually became the president of the Anti-Suffrage League in uh, 1917. Uh, the next one, I, I think this is debatable. Well, they're all debatable, but this one I would, I would question. But um, I've read, I read some accounts that said he bungled the, the outreach to the new Russian government after, between the fall of the Tsar and before the Bolsheviks came to power, the provisional Russian government. Uh, he was sent in 1917 by President Wilson um, to basically be the, you know, the US emissary um, to this new government. And he, he basically compelled, well, he, he withheld aid um, foreign assistance and told them that, you know, the United States would only recognize them and give them aid and such if they joined the war effort. This is during World War I, you know, join the Allies against the, um, the Germans and the Austrians and such. And, um, you know, so I think the, the people that would argue he bungled the outreach to Russia would say that he, um, you know, he basically, it, it was compelled the new Russian government to enter the war when maybe they weren't ready. Um, and they suffered tremendous defeats against the Austrians. And this actually led to the downfall of that government. They became so unpopular and, you know, it's the military, uh, it, it was such a mess for the military. Um, and then this helped to open the door for the Bolsheviks to uh, take over in the uh, October revolution. So again, I would, you know, I, I would question that one, but he also had a very paternalistic view of Latin America and other former colonies. Again, he was, you know, he was part of sort of the, the elite class of the day. And that was, I think, a lot of people in that, uh, that realm, that's how they viewed other parts of the world. Um, so again, not in keeping with, I think, how, how people would necessarily see such things today. And he was also in charge of the uh, occupation of the Philippines when he was Secretary of War. And that was, that was known as a very brutal and harsh, uh, repressive occupation where a lot of, lot of suffering in the, in the Philippines. So, um, but again, he was, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1913. It was actually, I think, the 1912 Peace Prize that was awarded in 1913 for bringing about better understanding between the countries of North and South America and initiating important arbitration agreements between the United States and other countries. And again, I would argue that the Boundary Waters Treaty is probably the most important arbitration agreement that he uh, was responsible for. So how did, how did the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909 come about? <clears throat> well, it wasn't just created from nothing. It wasn't created from scratch. There were a series of controversies uh, involving Boundary Waters with Canada. Um, chief among them was probably uh, the St. Mary's and Milk River. Um, this is between Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana, where uh, the Americans were basically diverting the river keeping the water from going to Canada. They, the Americans were using it for their own irrigation. And you know, this upset a lot of the Canadian farmers. The Canadians had also been upset about the Chicago River diversion where the, we had, the Americans had basically caused the Chicago River to flow the other direction so that it was draining water from Lake Michigan to flow out into the Mississippi River. 
Um, it was basically for sanitation reasons we did this, but the Canadians um, were upset then and afraid that we were, you know, taking water that was also belonged to them. And by the way, I'll say they are still, despite the Boundary Waters Treaty and you know, our great relations with them, the Canadians are still always afraid that we're going to try to take their water, especially from the Great Lakes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, by the way, the, you know, if we look at the Great Lakes, I think most of us would say there are five, right? And a geography will tell you there are five. But a hydrologist will actually say there are four because Lake Huron and Lake Michigan have the same lake from a hydrological point of view. Um, so the, the Canadians were worried that anytime you take water out of Lake Michigan, you're also taking it out of Lake Huron. So there were, there were a bunch of predecessor agreements that sort of you know, laid the groundwork. Um, we had already had an international boundary commission with Mexico that was set up in 1895. Um, we actually had something called the International Waterways Commission with Canada in 1905. This was uh, set up in response to Canadian concerns and their request for an agreement to basically manage the shared lakes and, and waterways. It didn't really work out. It didn't have, didn't really have a lot of teeth to it. Um, and it was thought to be ineffective. And that's why the powers that be thought it'd be better to have something you know, beyond that. We'd had a serious dispute with, the, with Canada, with, with basically with Great Britain about the Alaska Panhandle and the, the boundary there. And it was resolved um, by, a, um, by an arbitration board and both sides were pleased with the outcome and thought that this was a successful um, mechanism to use uh, for such cases. So, and we also had had uh, something, we had a lot of fisheries disputes and had negotiated with Canada something called the Inland Fisheries Treaty which we, the United States, never assigned, but it had a lot of similar mechanisms that the Boundary Waters Treaty did. And then later, you know, some of these mechanisms were incorporated in the Boundary Waters Treaty. So basically all these predecessor agreements, and then um, along with some of the controversies regarding boundary waters of the day, combined with uh, Elihu Root's uh, fondness for arbitration agreements, and that, that led to the uh, Boundary Waters Treaty. Um, and I, I would also like to point out that, you know, obviously some of the inspiration would have come from Root and then also his, his Canadian counterpart was a man named uh, George, um, George Gibbons, who was a prominent Ontario lawyer who had actually been the, uh, the Canadian, he'd been the Canadian chair of the International Waterways Commission, the predecessor um, to the Boundary Waters Treaty and, and the, I, the International Joint Commission. Um, you know, so they, you know, I'm sure they deserve a lot of the credit, but they weren't the only ones working on this. Root had somebody named Chandler Anderson, who was his, uh, his legal advisor, I believe, who did a lot of the, the, basically the heavy lifting in terms of the actual negotiation. And I'm sure they would have had uh, a lot of staff back in Washington and Ottawa that was supporting them with, you know, drafting the text and clearing it with the political powers that be and that sort of thing. So what was Root's role in the negotiation though? And what, what part did he play in the, the Boundary Waters Treaty? Well, it's very important to remember that at that time, Canada was still a British dominion. So since, since 1867, after the British Parliament passed the uh, British North America Act, it had been a semi-autonomous, um, semi-independent state with its own laws, judicial system, um, you know, some, somewhat self-governing, its own legislation and bureaucracy, but it was still considered British dominion and its foreign relations were still managed by Great Britain, right? So any, anything, any agreements with the United States had to be taken care of by the British rather than the Canadians themselves. Um, and it, by the way, at that time, Canada, it wasn't the same country we know today. In fact, Nova Scotia didn't join until uh, 1949. So what did, what did Root do? So Root went to London and he convinced His Majesty's government to let the Canadians negotiate on their own behalf. Root went to London and he convinced His Majesty's government to let the Canadians negotiate on their own behalf. So this, I mean, it seems obvious now. We look at the sound and say, well, well, of course he would do that. But at the time, this is a visionary act. People wouldn't necessarily have expected that. Um, you know, I mean, Canada was a British dominion. That's who would in charge of their, their foreign affairs. Um, but you can you could easily envision that, you know, anytime there's a negotiation between 
countries between great powers, especially, you know, it's very easy to see that they may be, they'll be making trade-offs, right? And you could easily imagine the British making some concession to the Americans regarding Canadian interests um, in exchange for something, maybe an issue that was important to them in another part of the world, right? So by doing this, by having the Canadians take control of the negotiations themselves, um, this, this ensured that the people with the vested interest in the outcome to, were able to negotiate and basically it led to a much more robust agreement that had the support of the Canadian people, uh, better reflected their interests and would basically, it would function better and be more enduring. And of course it has, it's still, you know, it's still with it. We still have this treaty today. It's still very much in force. Um, also negotiating a treaty on its own behalf, and I, I believe this was the very first time the Canadians did this, helped to bolster Canadian confidence and their identity as an independent nation. So this is important and, and you know, it, it raised the government stature and this really helped to advance Canada and the concept of Canada as an independent sovereign state. Um, you know, it, it helped to move that along. So that's one of the reasons that the title of my talk is called the, the genius of the boundary water treaty because of uh, Root's action in this regard. Now, I, I want to make a caveat because if, there, if there's anybody who's, you know, studied this more than me out there. So what I've told you about Root going to London and convincing His Majesty's government to allow the Canadians to negotiate on their own behalf, um, this, when I worked at the International Joint Commission, this was accepted as historical fact. And this was basically I, International Joint Commission lore. People would say, oh yeah, he was a visionary. In my research, I actually have not been able to verify that he did that. There was, I haven't found a record of him going to London. Um, but I do believe it's true. I hope that you'll believe that's true too. And, and actually, I, I did not unfortunately have time before this presentation to do more research on that, but I know they have a lot of archives on route up at Hamilton and I intend to go up there and just to be able to prove my own satisfaction that is indeed, indeed the case. So the Boundary Waters Treaty, what did it do? Um, and you know, how does it work? So it defines the boundary waters, first of all, which are from the main shore to the main shore of any lake or body of water that the boundary passes through. So it's not including uh, tributary, tributaries, that, tributaries that do not cross the boundary are not included, um, but anything else that the boundary crosses is included. It also prioritizes the use of the boundary waters. So um, for instance, uh, during some of the controversy of the um, with Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River in recent years, uh, people who are recreational boaters will be complaining, well, like I can't get my boat out at you know, a certain time because of the way the lake is being regulated. And you know, there's a lot of them and they're very powerful and have a lot of political influence, but the Boundary Waters Treaty doesn't include anything about recreational boating. So the priorities are first and foremost are uh, um, domestic use, which is drinking water and sanitation. Second of all, it's navigation. And third is uh, power and navigation. Um, so even, you know, navigation is considered an important interest, but, you know, if there's a competing demand from, uh, com competing demand for, you know, drinking water, you know, they'll lose out. Um, it was also a very uh, visionary agreement in that it, it, it was basically considered one of the very first environmental treaties because it limits transboundary pollution um, and has, you know, basically the, the the basic idea of the treaty is to prevent actions on one side of the boundary from harming people on the other side. So because of that, any project, any you know, sort of civil engineering infrastructure project that affects boundary waters on one side that will affect the levels or flows on the other side has to be approved by the institution that was set up by the Boundary Waters Treaty. And that is what's called the International Joint Commission. And that's, uh, that's where I used to work. And, uh, that was established by the, by the international, by the Boundary Waters Treaty. And I should note, it was actually, that was not Root's idea. That was his Canadian counterparts. That was George Gibbons' idea to have a permanent, for a permanent commission. So what does the International Joint Commission do? So actually, have people here heard of it? Has anybody heard of the International Joint Commission? Okay, I, in a way, maybe that's good. Maybe that means that it's uh, working and not in the news a lot. Um, a few years ago, it wasn't in the news, even in this area, because of the, uh, the flooding on Lake Ontario, and there were some people that were blaming it for that, uh, which I'll, is rather disingenuous. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so it was basically 
um, you know, at its heart, it is an arbitration board, right? It's where Canada and the US, if they have a disagreement or dispute or just, you know, issues about boundary waters, they send that problem to the IJC to resolve on their behalf. And it, you know, it basically gives them political cover. Um, and it, you know, it, the idea is that it will allow a, a fair outcome, right, for, that both sides can live with. Um, so it was set up to investigate, resolve, and prevent boundary water disputes between the two countries. And it will also uh, has the authority to review and approve projects. So anything, any kind of infrastructure, any kind of dam um, that's being built uh, that will affect the levels and flows across the boundary has to, has to have be approved by the International Joint Commission. It also has the power to investigate transboundary water issues and recommend solutions. And this has happened many times. In fact, this is probably where it spends more of its energies uh, present day. Um, and this will be in response for requests from both, by tradition, it's both governments will give what they call a reference, a request at IGC to study a per certain issue and come up with a solution. And it also, it tries its best to operate by consensus, not doesn't happen all the time, but most, the vast majority of the decisions taken by the International Joint Commission are arrived at uh, through consensus. So it's set up by having six commissioners, and this, this is very important because obviously, you know, the United States is much larger, much more powerful than Canada, but we have equal representation, equal voice, equal authority within the International Joint Commission. There's three US, three Canadian, and what that means is that you can't have a decision made by just one country, right? Like, you know, there's some, you have to have at least one commissioner from the other country to join if it comes to a decision. And again, usually most of the decisions are made by, sorry, if it comes to a vote, most of the decisions are made by uh, consensus. The American commissioners are appointed by the president and then approved by the Senate. The Canadian commissioners are appointed by the prime minister. I believe they are approved by the, the Queen's representative, the Governor General. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's the case. And then, you know, they're, they're sort of the, the higher level people. They are staffed by people in their section offices in Ottawa, Washington, and the Great Lakes. The, in Windsor, Ontario, it's a Great Lakes office, and the, the Washington office is where I worked at the US section. Um, but then, in addition to the staff in the section, in the section offices, there are uh, various boards all along the boundary that report to the IJC. And they're the ones who are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of a particular shared watershed or water body. So there are seven control boards and those are the ones that will manage the, the outflows from a dam um, you know, to regulate the water levels and, and flows you know, in a given body of water. And then there's watershed boards, a couple of Great Lakes advisory boards and um, some other ones. And I think it's, it's very important to uh, note just as Actually, sorry, let me go back a second to the previous one. Yeah, sorry. So um, the commissioners, when they're appointed, they're not there to represent their own country. And that's, that's made clear to them. Um, they're there to represent the Boundary Waters Treaty or to do justice to the Boundary Waters Treaty and to, and to basically arrive at decisions that are for the benefit of the watershed in question and the people in those those communities, so they're supposed to they're basically supposed to put aside, um, you know, their identity as an American as a Canadian and basically be impartial about their decisions. That's the ideal. Does it always work that way? You know, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say that's always the case, but it is the ideal they strive for. And I, from what I've I've had quite a lot of experience with this organization, and I think they take that that role very seriously. Um, so the IJC boards, um, similarly, when the people who are appointed to the IJC boards, they're not there to represent their own countries or even the organization that they're from. They're there to provide their own impartial professional expertise um, towards the decisions that that board has to undertake. So here's a map of the, the border. You can see these are areas that are covered by the boards. It basically covers the whole, whole border of, of the United States and Canada. Um, even up through Alaska. And the members of the boards are drawn from uh, federal agencies, state and provincial governments, um, local governments, indigenous representatives. Uh, there are some academics, um, scientists, and there's always equal number from the US and from Canada. 
So it's been in existence for over 100 years, and it has a long record of uh, success. Um, I think the Columbia, so the Columbia River Treaty, uh, the IJC is actually not involved in that now, but it did, uh, the Columbia River Treaty is the result of the Canadian and American government sending a reference to the International Joint Commission to do some studies. So the Columbia River Treaty is based on proposals put forward by the International Joint Commission, I think back in the 1940s. And I mean, it, it's a, you know, some people may argue about um, the impact that the dams have had on the environment and that sort of thing, but it's still, it's a marvel of bilateral cooperation, the way that, you know, we pay Canada for energy storage and flood control, and then, um, you know, both sides derive benefits in terms of energy production. Um, so it's, it's really an engineering marvel and also a marvel of bilateral cooperation. Similarly, we, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway and the way that we manage the St. Lawrence River in the Great in uh, Lake Ontario is based on some studies that were done um, by the International Joint Commission, um, I think even before World War II, um, even though the, the seaway itself wasn't built until the 50s. Um, and that's this picture here, I, that's uh, President Eisenhower and uh, Queen Elizabeth in her younger days inaugurating the St. Lawrence Seaway. <clears throat> Same for the Niagara River Treaty, that's based on um, some studies and ideas that were put forward by the, uh, by the International Joint Commission. And so the Niagara River Treaty is not a treaty that's managed by the IJC. Um, they have some involvement, but uh, um, I worked a little bit on that treaty. It's actually interesting. Sorry, I, I told Joanne I wasn't gonna go off on tangents, but I'm gonna tell you this. The, the priority of that treaty is for uh, the aesthetics and the, the basically, you know, keeping the falls as a beautiful visual, you know, scenery to for people to go and look at. Basically, you know, I guess of tourism, it probably considered the uh, priority of that treaty. Um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Uh, when I was on the Canada desk, we did a revision of that, um, but it's that had been around since I think the 1970s, and that was based on some ideas put forward by the International Joint Commission, and in, in response to a request from the governments, and then just hundreds of other. Um, projects that have been approved by the IJC and studies that they've completed. So just as Elihu Root, you know, there are some things that we would question about him today. Um, you know, the IJC is not perfect. There's been a lot of controversies. A lot of people have said that they, um, over its history, they have not given enough representation to indigenous people um, living along the waters that are impacted by their decisions. Uh, they're doing a lot to work on that now. And in fact, when I was there, uh, we were writing an Indigenous Peoples Engagement Policy, and um, even since then, I think there's now a Canadian commissioner who's from one of the Canadian First Nations. So, you know, they're working, they're recognize that and making progress. Um, and then, you know, there's always anywhere along the border, their water, their lakes, their rivers, where, you know, some of the people are not going to be happy with the decisions that are made um, regarding the levels and the flows. Um, and I think the the prime example of this is in Lake Ontario, where um, we came up with a, uh, a new regulation plan called Plan 2014 that was instituted just in the end of 2016, came into effect. You may remember that the spring of 2017 is when we had record precipitation and floods in Lake Ontario. Um, and then we had a, a repeat of that in 2019. So there are a lot of people that would blame this new plan and then consequently blame the IJC for this, these flooding events, which is, you know, I, I think it's quite disingenuous, especially there's, I won't name names, but I will say our current congresswoman and our former government were among the people who would try to blame the IJC. And this gets into, um, you know, it's just silly. It's like blaming the weatherman for the weather. I mean, there was just the, it's really blame anything, it's climate change because it was just record precipitation um, that you know we'd never seen before in both of those years, two years, not in a row, but close to it. Um, but this just gets into, you know, part of the IJC's role is to be sort of, you know, it's like this third party that both governments can blame when it's politically convenient for them. And it, you know, it sort of functions in that role too, and that, that serves its purpose. So, um, so future challenges, you know, obviously, uh, climate change is a big one. And basically having to adapt to the, you know, new, new precipitation regimes and uh, new, you know, extreme weather events that are coming. Um, and, you know, I think 2017 and 2019 are just examples of that. And the IJC is doing a lot, 
they've got a, what's called an adaptive management committee set up now so that they could be more nimble in adjusting the regulation plans for the various watersheds under their, their um, control um, in response to you know, changing climate and changing um, precipitation. Um, related to that, you know, I think water demands are only gonna increase on uh, places like the Great Lakes for, for human consumption, for irrigation. I mentioned before, uh, the Canadians are always afraid that we're going to come and take the water that they think, you know, is either there or that they, they share with us. And, um, you know, every few years you'll hear about some crazy scheme. Somebody down in the American Southwest wants to divert water down for irrigation projects down there to replenish water that's been lost from the Colorado, Colorado River or something like that. Um, so these are just issues that the IJC is going to have to manage going forward. There's a lot more emphasis at the IJC now on maintaining ecosystem health. Even though it was an early example of an environmental treaty, it didn't go into the details on anything like ecosystem health. Um, a lot more emphasis now at the IJC on engaging the local communities and decisions um, and also having a more integrated ecosystem focus. So why does all this matter? I mean, yeah, this is all well and good. You know, it's great that we have this treaty, you know, helps us get along with the Canadians. Yeah, you know, but what's what's the greater significance of this? So um, I think it's it's really important to just think about what our relationship with Canada has enabled us to do. And to do that, it's worth um, pursuing a mental exercise. Just, just imagine if we did not have that. Imagine, imagine for a moment if, you know, if we had a border that we had to heavily defend, or at least a border like with Mexico, where we had, you know, lots of, you know, well, not walls yet, but some walls, and, you know, it was basically a guarded border. By the way, the, our border with Canada, 5,500, over 5,500 miles, longest unprotected, undefended border in the world. I mean, you know, obviously we have custom posts and, you know, we have gates and things there, but other than that, there's no wall, there's no, there's no fences. You could, there's like thousands of miles where you could just like cross over. Um, so, you know, that's really saying something, I think, especially in this day and age, and, you know, unfortunately, especially seeing what's going on in Ukraine. But imagine, you know, again, it's, it takes work to maintain these relationships. And, and the point of my talk, I think, is just how, how much responsibility the Boundary Waters Treaty has for ensuring that close relationship and alliance with, with Canada by allowing us this, um, you know, to have this arbitration mechanism to work out our disputes. So if we didn't have that, what would the future, what could the future have been like? And again, remember, you know, the time this treaty was negotiated at the, in, the, in first in place in the beginning of the 1900s, Canada was still a British dominion. So imagine if we did not have that, and I'm just gonna, um, so I don't, are any of you fans of, anybody watched that show on Netflix, The Man in a High Castle, based on the Philip Dick series? Yeah, yeah, so, um, you know, the premise was that the United States had lost World War II, and, you know, America was controlled by the Japanese and, and Nazi Germany. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say that would have, you know, without the Boundary Waters Treaty, we would have been taken over by the, the Germans. But I think it's important to think that history could have been very, very different, right? Just little, little things along the way, you know, sort of like the butterfly effect. History could have been very different. And if we had not had the Boundary Waters Treaty and the International Joint Commission with Canada, and I think we, it would have been a lot more difficult to maintain the close relationship if we were always fighting and potentially having conflict with them over boundary waters. I mean, there's all, all over the world, there are places that you could you know, point to on a map where there's conflict or potential for conflict over boundary waters, right? And um, you know, we don't have to worry about that. And we were allowed to, we were able to work with the Canadians, have them as a close alliance, build partnerships, have them help us build partnerships with other parts of the world, with NATO, all these things that have basically led to the, you know, resulted in the, the post-war, post-World War II, peace and prosperity uh, for the most part that we've enjoyed to, you know, till this day. Um, so that's why I would say what makes the Boundary Waters Treaty special. And just in conclusion, here's a quote from John F. Kennedy. I'll read that in case it's kind of unclear. He said, uh, when addressing the uh, Canadian Parliament in 1961, President Kennedy said, uh, geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. Those whom nature hath so joined, 
let no man put asunder. So um, the Boundary Waters Treaty is the, the first example of Great Britain authorizing the Canadian officials to uh, negotiate with a foreign state on their own behalf. Um, and you know, so this sort of led to Canada being, you know, led them further down the path of being an independent uh, sovereign state. Um, one of our earliest, early example of a treaty that we had with Canada that led to, you know, other agreements we'd have with them in the future. Um, and just a very, very successful mechanism was set up to prevent and manage conflicts over shared waters that could have, you know, led to many, many other problems if they were not managed correctly. And this is why it brings us back to uh, Elihu Root and who together with his Canadian counterpart, George Gibbons really deserves so much credit for the vision to negotiate this treaty and, you know, basically institute, uh, create the institution of the International Joint Commission. So um, I will stop there and then see what questions you may all have. I'm gonna give the <coughs> microphone over to Joanne or? I'll just come around for everybody. Okay, yeah. So Sure, yeah. And uh, and thank you again for your for your time and attention. Thanks. Um, it sounds like that the longevity of this treaty is really remarkable. Are there <coughs> other prominent treaties that have other nations? Sorry? Or are there other prominent treaties that have the same longevity as this? Um not that I, not that I know of. We do have the agreement with Mexico that set up our boundary commission with them, which has since been changed to the Boundary and Waters Commission. That one's not. I would say that's not quite as successful. Actually, we have a lot more fights with Mexico than we do with Canada over boundary waters. And in terms of other countries elsewhere in the world having similar treaties, um, I don't know of any that are as old as this or have the longevity or are as successful. And actually, if I could just add on that point. So both when I worked at the Canada desk and when I worked at the IJC and then later worked in the Office of Conservation and Water on a lot of other water issues, um, we would have people coming from other countries to study how the IJC works. They would come, you know, they would come and want to meet the staff at the IJC to ask questions because they were hoping to emulate it. They're hoping to set up something like that in their own country, um, sometimes internally, right? Sometimes between neighboring provinces or states or something to manage water or sometimes you know, to propose to their a neighboring country about how to manage their boundary waters. So I think it's, you know, all in basically in the water, you know, sort of water diplomacy community, it's really recognized around the globe as a, as a tremendous success. Hi, um, two, thank you, two things. One, you spoke of the ecosystem of health. And so is there concern with the the commission deals with or is that also the concern of health? And the second question, is then I can pass this yeah. back, is oh, we tend to think so much about the Great Lakes and not about Alaska. And Alaska is part of it. So are there are there issues with the, the boundary between Alaska and Canada? Thank you, and those are great, great questions. Um, so first about the invasive spe species. So um, we have a separate agreement um, with Canada called the Great Lakes, I think it's called the Great Lakes Fisheries. There's Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. I can't remember the name of the agreement. We have a separate agreement for managing uh, invasives in the Great Lakes, basically for managing fisheries in the Great Lakes. The chief focus of that commission is controlling the sea lamprey, which is an invasive species that came over from Europe in ballast water on ships. Um, is tremendous, uh, has had a tremendously negative impact on fisheries, especially recreational fisheries in the Great Lakes. So that's a separate commission and that's a separate agreement, but you know, it's not, I should say it is something that the IJC follows and um, it's not, when I was there, it wasn't necessarily a priority. I mean, it would be discussed from time to time, problems with invasive species. But I think um, there are many other avenues of cooperation between the US and Canada on um, boundary and you know, border environment issues um, in a lot of the discussions on controlling invasive species basically take place in other fora. So that, that would be my answer on that question. Um, for Canada and Alaska, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, there is uh, one of the, Board. I can't remember the name of the board, but there is a board up that 
IJC board um, responsible for managing boundary waters up in Alaska, between Alaska and Yukon, I believe. Um, anyway, there, yeah, I would be the first to admit though that uh, in terms of staff time, in terms of the commissioner's focus, the Great Lakes are always taking precedence. And part of that is just because of the, the population distribution of both countries. I mean, I think it's a third or half of the Canadian population basically lives um, along Lake Ontario. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's where people tend to focus more of the attention. And then also some of the Western um, shared waterways. Uh, but, um, and again, the, so the Columbia River has a, its own treaty that's being negotiated, renegotiated now. There's a lot of attention between the two governments on that. The IJC tracks it somewhat, but it's not really that involved these days. But just in terms of Canada and Alaska, so um, this is just a story of how closely our cooperation is. We have, we still have all kinds of boundary disputes with Canada. I think a lot of people don't recognize that. There's all kinds of places around the world where the Canadians in the United States have not settled on where the boundary is. And one of that, um, one of those places is in, um, in the Arctic. So the boundary between, what is it on this map? I forget. Anyway, the, the boundary between Alaska, the northern tip, is the maritime boundary is not settled. So basically how far, and that, that matters now because of the, uh, you know, the Law of the Sea Treaty and the extended continent, what they call the extended continental shelf. How far out can we claim on the extended continental shelf and what can the Canadians claim? So, you know, so we've had a dispute about that for years. So how do we resolve that? And this is not necessarily the IJC, this just points to the closeness between the two countries. Well, we're just studying it together. Like we send our scientists on a Canadian uh, hydrography ship to survey it and vice versa. We have a, um, every year, in fact, a good friend of mine was part of this mission um, where they would go out and they, you know, I think alternate years they either use the um, Canadian Coast Guard ship or US Coast Guard ship and they would go out and run survey. And then, you know, we're still negotiating with them on this. Um, but anyway, that just, that's an example of, uh, you know, how close the two countries are and how, how well we cooperate. Thank you. That, that's an, also an excellent question. Yeah. So at the time in the early 1900s, there were there were probably more disputes, actual disputes over boundary waters than we have today. Um, in fact, I think, I think because of the success of the International Joint Commission, you know, we've managed to basically, a lot of the disputes, or a lot of the issues between us, we just, you know, we just sort of manage it at a low level. Back then, there actually was a fear that some of these disputes could have turned into conflict, right? And, you know, not, it could have just been something like a bunch of, um, you know, farmers in Alberta taking up arms and marching across the border to like basically take down a dike or something like that. But you can imagine where that would have led, right? So in the early days of the Boundary Waters Treaty, there was a lot more actual arbitration over actual, uh, actual disputes, um, such as the St. Mary's, Milk, um, St. Mary's and Milk River dispute that I mentioned earlier, um, Pembina Dike. There's a lot of, there were a lot of other ones in the early days. In fact, if you look at the, if the text of the Boundary Waters Treaty, there are some, some of the issues are actually written into the treaty itself, including the St. Mary's and Milk, and they're still an existing um, board uh, managing the, those waters today. So did, that, did I answer the, the question? Yeah, I think, I think you also said like, why, you know, why, why would it, so that it was, the IJC was set up in response to many of these issues. And again, it wasn't, I don't know if, if it was really Root that was so much in favor of having a permanent commission. It was really George Gibbons, his Canadian counterpart, that had proposed that and really pushed for that. Um, but I think, you know, as we've seen, it's, it's been very successful. Thank you very, very much, David, for your presentation. It was just, it was amazing. I mean, I didn't know half of this. 
Um, having lived up on, in Messina, uh, right on the seaway, uh, it, it always amazed, it amazed me that the seaway ever got built. And I think now I understand why it could have gotten built. Uh, and I wonder if without the boundary, water boundary treaty that it ever could have gotten built. But probably not. It was, it was one of the most amazing engineering feats that I've ever read about. And, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our program next month is, uh, and I, I, unfortunately, when Jim uh, decided to retire from this job, he didn't leave the details of what the next month's program was. So it's very intriguing. It, all I know is that CNY scandals. Uh, so we don't know what scandals the speaker is going to be telling us about. So you can use your imagination between now and, and next month. Um, but it will be here, barring any unforeseen circumstances. It will, again, be an in-person uh, program. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention before the program is that there was something left on the seat of your chair. Um, it is a part of our uh, 60th anniversary celebration. We've had little refrigerator magnets made with the uh, image of the building uh, on it. So please feel free to take that. I am going to be giving David one with a coffee mug, and you don't even have to give a speech to get your <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, if you haven't um, been in the building in a while and haven't seen the Art Center uh, exhibit, uh, it is coming down at the end of this month. So if you have time, take a little uh, opportunity to look at that exhibit because we will be putting up the uh, the um, our exhibit for the 16th anniversary of the historical society. So thank you very much for coming out and enjoy the rest of the nice day. Yes, by some uh, improvement okay. progress. But if you have time to take some too, Ernest, that would be you know, that would be great too. Yeah, because it's a really nice display. Yes. And want to talk about yes. It. Thank you. Thank you.